standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Scripture is found in Daniel 11, verse 45. So if you open your Bibles to Daniel 11, verse 45, we will read that. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Dustin? The title of today's sermon is Five Reasons to Study Daniel 11. And with most things, not all things, but um, I've noticed that um, with a lot of subjects within this movement, it is a, a really good idea, or even I would say an advantage, to know um, at least some details about recent Adventist history. Um, that will often uh, let us know how certain doctrines have affected the church, at least recently. You know, it's always good to know our, our pioneer history, um, those who, who started our church. But um, some of the things that have happened in recent years, like in the last 50 to 60 years, have also really impacted the church. And um, the way that we interpret or view prophecy is one of those things that has been affected. Other things include uh, the topic of sin, um, the nature of Christ, um, how, we, uh, how we interact and how we view the spirit of prophecy. Um, a lot of those topics have been affected uh, by our recent history, and so I believe it's a, a big benefit. So we're going to at least look at some aspects of recent history and how it affects our viewpoint or our perspective on Daniel chapter 11. Well, before we begin, let's uh, open in another word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we have a wonderful place to worship today. We are also grateful that we are able to uh, communicate and study with and worship with those from around the world through technology. I pray that um, you would touch my lips today, that the things I say might be a glory to you and your Son and might be edifying to the body of Christ. And I ask a blessing upon myself and those that are hearing today. Uh, not because we deserve a blessing, but because you purchased that right and that, that privilege with giving your Son, Jesus Christ, for us. And it is in his name that we pray these things. Amen. Okay, so five reasons. Our first reason that we're going to look at to study Daniel 11 is the pioneer view of Daniel 11 differs from the current accepted SDA teaching. So we see a, a tension there, and um, that is uh, one reason to look into something further. When you see conflict or some disagreement in uh, the way that we, we look at a certain topic, and I believe that is, that is a good reason. And so we're going to dig a little deeper into this and uh, identify what those different viewpoints are. The first is the accepted pioneer view was that the entire uh, chapter, including verses 40 through 45, should be taken literally, which would apply to whoever controls Turkey. Uh, sometimes it's called, when you look into the Adventist literature, the Eastern question. And uh, so that was the general accepted view of uh, the pioneer church, especially um, developing around the 1870s and then getting much stronger and continuing all the way through the life of Ellen White. 
Now the viewpoint that uh, comes into uh, a little tension with that we'll mention in a few minutes, but I want to share with you uh, an excerpt out of Bible readings for the home circle. And this was the uh, kind of the gold standard for Bible studies uh, in the days of the pioneers. And um, we uh, read the following, the Eastern question. What briefly stated is the Eastern question? The driving out of Turkey from Europe and the final extinction of the Turkish Empire with the world embracing events that follow. It has been otherwise described as the driving of the Turk into Asia and a scramble for his territory. What scriptures are devoted to the Turkish power? Daniel 11, 40 through 45, and we just read uh, verse 45. Revelation 9 and Revelation 16, 12. Note, the 11th chapter of Daniel, Turkey is dealt with under the title, the King of the North, and Revelation 9 under the symbol of the drying up of the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the sounding of the fifth and sixth trumpets and in Revelation 16 under the symbol of the drying up of the waters of the chief river of the Turkish Asiatic possessions, the great river Euphrates. The actual drying up of the river Euphrates was the signal for the overthrow of ancient Babylon. And so this is, um, this is a demonstration of what the, the pioneer church believed on the topic. And it goes on, goes on to study a little deeper into it, but I just kind of wanted to show you that, um, that when you grabbed a book and to give a Bible study to someone off your shelf in the late 1800s, this is what you would find. Now, the, the view that uh, comes into a little contention with this uh, idea is um, what I'm going to call the figurative view. The figurative view teaches that the chapter should be taken literally until verse 40. Verses 40 through 45 should then be taken figuratively, which, and this is kind of important to, to remember, which allows the application of the papacy. So rather than applying Turkey to, the, the, to verse 45, um, modern Seventh-day Adventists will apply the papacy to it. And... Um, We'll see, I think, uh, during our study why um, that causes uh, one or two other problems. We're not going to go too much into the technical aspects of it, but just kind of go over the history and some of the differences and where this teaching um, that we're going to call the figurative view, where it came from and who promoted it. Uriah Smith actually called this view the mystical method of interpretation. And when we get to Daniel 12, verse 1, uh, the king of the, mo the north is no more, as he has already, uh, quote, come to his end. Uh, it's a misinterpretation of prophecy to say that the papacy is the power that has come to his end, in verse 45, because uh, when we study uh, prophecy, we know that the papacy will be the persecuting power uh, in, in the time of the end, uh, during the time of trouble, after Michael stands up, which is Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. The papacy cannot be the power that comes to its end, in verse 45, because John tells us that the papacy will be around when Christ returns. And so that's, that's one of the maybe a little more technical uh, reasons why there is an issue with uh, taking this figurative uh, view. All right, so Ellen White uh, says the following, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scripture upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled Views of Prophecies in Prophetic Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study and interpretation. And she goes through these, um, through a few of them. She says every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. And she goes through a few more, doesn't get to the 11th, but then she says this, 
The above is a portion, so she's admitting that there's a portion of all of Miller's rules. The above is a portion of these rules, and in our study of the Bible, we shall all, all do well to heed the principles set forth. And so this, this shows what Ellen White thought about Miller's rules and how important they were uh, to adhere to when we uh, study the Bible. And here is the specific rule that, um, that applies to us in today's study. Rule number 11, how to know when a word is used figuratively. If it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. So it's a real simple rule. And so as, as you study, and I'm, that's one of the main reasons why I'm giving this presentation is to, um, to encourage you to study this issue further and study it on your own and uh, engage in using these, uh, these principles that uh, and the rules that Miller laid out that helped him in his study. It helped him uh, find um, basically the sanctuary doctrine for us. It helped him identify 1844 as a significant date in the history of this universe. And so um, the, the early Adventists uh, adopted these rules because they saw the benefit and value in them. Let's move on to our next reason why we should study Daniel 11. Reason number two, we will find that there have been great efforts to do away with the pioneer method of interpreting Daniel 11. It wasn't just a, um, a smooth transition where some people just started believing a little differently. Um, it took effort to change the the direction of the church on this topic, and we'll see a little bit of those, those efforts and who, uh, what players were involved in them. So we will find that Ellen White reproves uh, elders Prescott and Daniels uh, for planning to, quote, overhaul the literature. And uh, here is, uh, here is that a portion of that letter that Ellen White wrote to these two men. Messages, or message after message has come to me from the Lord concerning the dangers surrounding you and Elder Prescott. I have seen that Satan would have been greatly pleased to see Elders Prescott and Daniels undertake the work of a general overhauling of our books that have done a good work in the field for years, but neither of you is called of God to that work. Representations have passed before me which indicate that you and Elder Prescott and others united with you have been inclined to search out things to be criticized or condemned in our printed publications. Were encouragement given you, changes and revisions would be made in accordance with the ideas that you have in mind. I am bidden to counsel you to leave the work of book revision and devote the entire energies of your mind to the presentation of Bible truth to souls who have never heard the third angel's message. If you and Brother Prescott were to sow broadcast seeds of uncertainty and distrust in the minds of others, God would call you to stern account for this evil. And so this is 1910. And by the language, we can tell that this work had not begun. Um, she was shown this to prevent the work of changing the literature. And it's just, it's obvious by the language that it hadn't been done. This is a warning not to do it. And so that was in uh, 1910. This is only five years before Ellen White's death. And we see one other uh, event that took place, the 1919 Bible Conference. Some of those in attendance were Lacey, Prescott, and Daniels. So those were the two that the letter was just addressed to. And on the other side of the aisle, so to speak, would be Sorensen, Longacre, Wilkinson, and Washburn. And some of you might recognize some of those names. Um, 
and the issues at hand that probably took up most of the time during this conference were the King of the North, the Trinity, and uh, Ellen White's relationship to the Bible. Um, we have access to the actual transcripts of these meetings, so you can uh, read in great detail who was saying what and how they responded to one another. Um, what's one of the things I find most interesting about the, the transcript is the last thing, you know, a stenographer was taking, um, taking record. And the last thing we have is Elder Daniels telling the stenographer to stop. So <laughs> I find that funny because she recorded him saying stop, and then that was the last thing. So um, the, the meetings were getting a little heated, and so uh, I believe that's why, um, why he gave that, that directive. So five years after Ellen White died, and 10 years after her warning and rebuke to these two men, uh, we have this Bible conference that is now engaging in the very behavior and, and plans that Ellen White warned them not to engage in. And so that's it's a, uh, a very disappointing um, development in our church. Another thing that, that happened, uh, efforts to change our books and our, our belief on particularly Daniel chapter 11, were the changes in the book Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. Um, now, his viewpoint was not entirely stripped from the book, um, but the, um, if you get the earlier versions, the pre-1900 versions, he devotes, I believe, uh, about eight pages to just verse 45 alone. Uh, normally, you'll look at some of the verses that he deals with. And by the way, it wasn't just him. It was a committee of men that studied together that compiled that, all that information in that book. But uh, typically, uh, a verse will, will have about you know, a third of a page or a half a page of commentary, maybe three-quarters of a page of commentary. But when you get to verse 45, uh, in those earlier versions, you have eight, eight pages of commentary just on that verse. So he had a lot to, they had a lot to say uh, about it. And a majority of that, I believe, was stripped out of the newer versions. So like I said, it didn't totally take it away, but um, some of the reasons and uh, support for the church's position was, was stripped out. So listen to what uh, Ellen White says about this particular book, Daniel and the Revelation. Daniel and Revelation, great controversy, patriarchs and prophets, and desire of ages should now go to the world. The grand instruction contained in Daniel and, Re and Revelation has been eagerly pursued by many in Australia. This book has been the means of bringing many precious souls to a knowledge of the truth. Everything that can be done should be done to circulate thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. I know of no other book that can take the place of this one. It is God's helping hand. And this was uh, written in 1901. So this gives you an idea of what she thought of the things written in that book. If there were really serious issues that would throw someone off, serious issues in it that would deceive someone into believing uh, that there would be a certain way mark or a certain um, a warning sign that was portrayed in that book that really wasn't real at all, I don't, I don't see God um, inspiring her to, to write these words. So it just wouldn't, it wouldn't fit. It wouldn't make sense or square. So let's move on to our next reason. Reason number three, the origins of the figurative view. Um, one reason why I believe this is important is because it will give us an idea not only where these uh, new perspectives or new approaches came from, but we can, we will also see that this isn't just what these men brought into the church. You'll see some other things that were brought in. And that, that's one thing that opened my eyes. 
they didn't just bring in a new view of Daniel chapter 11. And we're going to see the other things that were brought in and also some of the reasons, at least one of the major reasons, why um, other ideas were brought into the church, and I believe against God's will. And I also believe it's important to know where our doctrines come from, especially when there has been change. Um, it's similar to um, you know, the water that we get up in the morning and drink. We want to know where it comes from, right? Um, in our little town, uh, we used to have some of the best drinking water in the valley, just straight from city water was good. Um, but since, or in recent years, um, some companies have convinced the city that our water wasn't all that great and needed to have chlorine added to it and fluoride added to it. And so we're concerned with where our water comes from when we drink, and drink a glass of it in the morning. And um, we weren't happy with it, and so we're filtering it now and uh, some, using some pretty intense filtration, and we're getting good water. But we had to know where that water was coming from and what was in it to know that we needed to filter it. So that's always a good, uh, good illustration in my mind to remember that our, our spiritual drink, our spiritual food also needs to be identified and we need to know where it's coming from and whether or not it has something in it we don't want. So one of the figures that, uh, that promoted the figurative view was Raymond Cottrell. And he was the grandson of Roswell Cottrell. So Cottrell is a familiar name when you, when you look into Adventist history and so don't confuse him with the pioneer Cottrell this is uh, his grandson. And he wrote extensively about the figurative view. And he wrote a, a paper called Pioneer Views on Daniel 11 and Armageddon. And um, in, this, uh, in this paper, he basically uh, goes out and tries to find other pioneers that... Um, that were at odds with most of the brethren. And he highlights those. And one of those that he highlights, I believe, is, um, is James White. And that's something that's very common now, is that James White, for a time, uh, promoted that the king of the north was the papacy. But we're going to see why he... Um, why he believed that and why he was pushing that idea. And, uh, some other things about uh, Cottrell is that he embraced the evangelical gospel, and we won't get a whole lot into that. I've talked about that in the past, and I'll probably talk about it also in the future, get more, uh, some more detail on what the evangelical gospel is. But in general, it, it's the gospel that comes from the churches that the pioneers came out of. And that gospel found its way back in, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. He rejected the day for a year principle. He also rejected, ended up rejecting the sanctuary doctrine. He wrote a paper uh, in 2002, and it was called the sanctuary doctrine, asset or liability. And so that kind of gives you an idea of where that paper went. It was a lot along the lines of Des Ford, um, in his thinking, and I believe he went down some of the same paths that, um, that Ford went down. He ended up also rejecting uh, Ellen White, which is kind of a necessity if you're going to reject the doctrines that she so, <laughs> so prominently promotes um, in all of her books. So, in the, in the article, uh, the Pioneer Views article, um, I had mentioned that he, he points to other uh, pioneers that uh, didn't necessarily believe just like what the church officially believed. But we're going to look at um, the issue or the case of James White just for a moment. And this is recorded in 3 Bio, page 96. It says, One of the testimonies to, to individuals 
delivered most likely only in oral form, was addressed to James White, a reproof for his course of action just before the combined camp meeting and general conference session. He and Uriah Smith held conflicting views on the prophecy of the King of the North, pictured in Daniel 11, and the power presented in verse 45 that would come to his end and none to help him, with none to help him. White, in his Sabbath morning address, September 28, in the newly pitched camp meeting tent, countered Smith's interpretations. He felt that Smith's approach, now listen to this, Smith's approach indicating that the world was on the verge of Armageddon would threaten the strong financial support needed for the rapidly expanding work of the church. So, is that a reason why we should alter our message? Because finances might not come in? It isn't. And I remember having several conversations with uh, Juan Contreras about organization. And from the very beginning, we knew that organizing would threaten support. And every single time we concluded, we looked at each other and we said, it doesn't matter. Right is right, and if God wants us to organize, that's not our, that's not our worry. And so, I don't believe it is that it should play a role in how we believe or how we um, conduct ourselves in God's work. Um, that's something that God will take care of. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to another individual who's been influential on this topic, and that's Lewis Weir. He wrote extensively on the, the new view or the, um, the figurative view, uh, including his book, The Kings of the North, or The King of the North in Jerusalem. He wrote another book that also addressed the topic, and it's called Mrs. White, Uriah Smith, and the King of the North. And uh, he would draw conclusions that would disagree with the conclusions that we have, have made. Uh, regarding the things that Ellen White has said about the King of the North um, and uh, also our, our views on the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. So he, he differs in his opinions on, on those, those things. But he's been very influential, and a lot of historic Adventists to this day still read and promote and sell <clears throat> Weir's material. Here's another name that is probably familiar to many of you, and I believe is um, one of the most important um, players when it comes to this doctrine and other doctrines coming into our church. Um, he wrote of the figurative view of the King of the North and Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, and that was a, a set, a volume set of books. Uh, he also contributed to probably was the primary contributor, contributor to Questions on Doctrine, and also responsible for the compilation Evangelism. And I don't really need to go into too much detail, but we know at least the, the latter two books, um, the deception and the uh, damage, damage especially with Questions on Doctrine, the damage that has been done to the church over the past 70 years almost 70 years now. Um, questions on doctrine was basically, in short, a, an attempt to appease the evangelical churches that identified us as a cult. And uh, there were questions that these evangelicals had, and the book is actually called uh, Answers to Questions on Doctrine. There were a few men that took it upon themselves without the official um, blessing of the church to answer these questions of the evangelicals, and the way they answered was not how you would have found in Bible readings for the home circle, for example. Um, they answered the way that they believed the evangelicals wanted them to answer so that we would be taken off of that list, that cult list, 
Yeah, the book is, is full of compromise. It compromised on the personality of God. It compromised on sin, the nature of Christ. And it also compromised on how we view uh, Ellen White. And the book Evangelism, <clears throat> though it is a compilation of Ellen White's writings, the way it is compiled and the way that the headers have been created um, lead people to ideas that really weren't intended in her original writings. And we've, we've seen a lot of that, so we don't need to go into those details. Leroy Froome writes the, uh, the following in a book called Movement of Destiny. The next logical and inevitable step in the implementing of our unified fundamental beliefs involved revision of certain standard works so as to eliminate statements that taught and thus perpetuated erroneous views on the Godhead. These productions must therefore be brought into harmony with the now declared faith of the church. And so I believe, this is the one thing about Froome, he was honest. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't really hide the fact that they thought it necessary to change some of our literature. And he even gives the reasons why. Um, I believe this is probably, his case is probably the most incriminating um, information regarding not only the, the figurative view of Daniel chapter 11, but a whole host of other doctrines that have, that have come into the church. Ellen White writes the following, and this is a, a rebuke. I believe, to men like Froome. The very same Satan is at work to undermine the faith of the people of God at this time. There are persons ready to catch up every new idea. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation are misrepresented. These persons do not consider that the truth has been set forth at the appointed time by the very men whom God was leading to do this special work. These men followed on step by step in the fulfillment of prophecy and those who have not had a personal experience in this work, so those that are living closer to our day, are to take the word of God and believe on their word who have been led by the Lord in proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. So her advice to us is to rely on those that were led by God in the beginning. And men like Froome didn't want to follow that advice. They wanted to um, look better in the eyes of the evangelical world and uh, take that reproach, that, that man-made reproach off of, off of their, the, the modern Adventist church. Another man that was influential that uh, also promoted or supported the figurative view was Roy Allen Anderson, and he wrote a book. I remember growing up with this book on our shelf, that bright orange and red, yellow and red book, Unfolding the Revelation. Um, he, uh, he repeats, even though it's a book on Revelation, he harkens back to Daniel chapter 11 and applies the things that are said about the papacy to the latter part of Daniel chapter 11. And he believes that uh, verse, verses 40 through 45 is a summary, and he applies it to like things, chapters uh, 17 and even some of chapter 18 of Revelation. And um, confusing the difference between the king of the north and the papacy. And in turn, uh, making the two the same. He also was uh, one of the primary contributors to questions on doctrine. And so I'm hoping you're seeing that the avenue through which the, the doctrines like the Trinity, uh, doctrines like the, uh, the un, unfallen nature of Christ, the doctrines of original sin, they all seem to be coming through similar avenues. And uh, with the new view or the figurative view of uh, Daniel chapter 11, it's, it is no different in my view. Um, in my eyes, because you have the same men for many of the same reasons 
bringing these new ideas into mainstream Seventh-day Adventism. That book, Questions on Doctrine, uh, horribly damaged the church. And uh, I believe some of these books that have been over on the right side of your screen um, are several examples of what we have read as books of a new order. These are books that are foreign to pioneer Adventism, books that say things that we had never heard or they had never taught before. And uh, so I believe we see Ellen White's prophecy fulfilled in a lot of these men and the books that they wrote. Reason number four, the practical significance of a literal interpretation of verses 40 through 45. So a literal interpretation of verse 45 in particular gives a final event that acts as a waymark just before Jesus leaves the sanctuary. The symbolic interpretation of this verse gives no such warning. The papacy comes to its end in that view at the second coming. Well, no, we know that the papacy comes to its end at the second coming of Christ, which would be too late for such a warning or landmark. So you see how that doesn't really fit, and we, we addressed that a little earlier, um, that the figurative um, view teaches the papacy is the power that shall come to its end, but we just know that that doesn't, uh, that doesn't square with what we know about Revelation chapter 13 and 17, and um, the papacy being the persecuting power of God's people at the end. All right, this is our final reason, reason number five. The possible impact on the acceptance of the three angels' messages. Some of you know who this man is, Josiah Litch. In 1838 to 1840, he was a leader in the Advent or Millerite movement. He published a paper on Revelation chapter 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and it was a very... Um, specific prediction uh, on August 11th, 1840. This came true and gave credibility to the midnight cry. Here is a description by uh, Elder Loughborough in a book called The Great Second Advent Movement. This striking fulfillment of the prophecy had a tremendous effect upon the public mind. It intensified the interest of the people to hear upon the subject of fulfilled and fulfilling prophecy. Dr. Litch said that within a few months after August 11th, 1840, he had received letters from more than 1,000 prominent infidels, some of them leaders of infidel clubs, in which they stated that they had given up the battle against the Bible and had accepted it as God's revelation to man. Some of these were fully converted to God and a number of them became able speakers in the great Second Advent movement. Some expressed themselves to Dr. Litch on this wise. We have said that expositor, expositors of prophecy quote from the musty pages of history to substantiate their claims of prophetic fulfillments, but in this case, we have the living facts right before our eyes. And so you see that back then, uh, when one of the pioneers put themselves out there and applied Miller's rules and made a prediction, um, and it came true, we can see the impact that that had on even unbelievers, probably more so on unbelievers. And uh, there is potential for a similar um, occurrence if we would step out in faith and uh, view Daniel chapter 11, specifically verse 45, in the way that the pioneers did. And that's the question we have. Will the same method of Bible interpretation also give strength to the loud cry? And uh, by the way, uh, many believe that verse 45 is the one remaining thing that has to happen before Michael stands up in chapter 12, verse 1. Here's what Ellen White has to say about the time that we know we're living in now. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel is nearly reached its complete fulfillment. 
Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. So this is where we find ourselves today. And we just, uh, we have an opportunity to dig into this issue deeper so that uh, possibly we will be able to experience what Josiah Litch did in his day. And this is our last, our last slide today. And it comes from a book called The Story of Daniel the Prophet. And it's by Haskell. He writes, the sealing angel goes through Jerusalem, which is the church, to, take, to place the seal of the living God on the foreheads of the faithful. And while this work is going forward, Turkey stands as a national guidepost to the world that men may know what is going on in the sanctuary above. And this book happens to be a book that Ellen White had hoped to be a shorter and more concise version of Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. It ended up being quite a long book. <laughs> and so, but it expresses the same views. It expresses the same approach to Daniel chapter 11. And I believe that speaks a lot to um, whether or not that was an accurate position or the accurate position that the church took in her day. And I believe it does support that. Um, our question is whether or not um, we believe we need a guidepost, whether or not we need a waymark to share to the world that might give our message uh, the impetus that it needs to reach 8 billion people so that each one of them can make a decision for God or for themselves. And so I, uh, my hope and prayer is that I have at least sparked some interest in the subject, if uh, maybe you hadn't been very interested in it before, uh, to dig deeper and to, for each one of us to make that choice. Do, do, we, do, do we believe we need that way mark uh, that the pioneers found so important and held so dear? Um, and so we, uh, we all have an opportunity to uh, look into this subject, dig deeper, and make that choice for ourselves and whether or not we want to include this in, in the way that we share the three angels' messages to the world and that it might give impetus to, to our message that we're sharing. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful to have so much material, so much material that we could probably never exhaust, exhaust it ourselves, but material that um, has set out a path for your people. You've given us a blueprint not only for organization, but for all of our doctrines. You have shined that light on the narrow path that is narrowing more and more as each day passes. We know that there are things in our lives that need to be shed and uh, we know that path is going to get so narrow that uh, even our shoes will be an encumbrance. I pray that um, this message will be uh, one that sparks interest in, uh, in your word and in the final way mark that you have given your people. I also pray that uh, we might accept your truth on this subject in a way that uh, will enhance and, uh, and give a synergistic effect of those that have never heard these things before, accepting the truth and accepting the Bible, those who may now hate the Bible, that they might accept your word and the salvation that you have uh, so freely offered to each and every one of us. And we pray to you, asking for these blessings, not because we deserve them, but because your son Jesus Christ deserves them and he purchased our lives with his own blood. And it is in his name that we pray, amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth. Pioneer Health and Missions.